for our first uh, part of the workshop on the discussion, really the presentation of the discussion paper of the policy options to reduce climate insurance protection gap. To introduce the speakers, uh, on my right, maybe your left, I have Dimitri Saferis, Head of Risk and Financial Stability Department of IOPA. On my left, I have Sujit Kapadia, Head of Market-Based Finance Division at the European Central Bank. Both have been, uh, both division has been working, have been working together. So I'm really pleased to have you here um, to set the scene. Uh, if we have time for questions uh, for the people, people joining online, please put them in the chat and my colleague uh, Margarita will read them out on the laptop and otherwise I invite the people here in the room to, to walk to the laptop. But I have to be cautious of the time, so let's see if we have enough time left for these uh, questions. So with that, uh, I would like to give the floor to Dimitris uh, to start the presentation on uh, the discussion paper, please. Dimitris. Thanks, Irene, and uh, good morning also from uh, my side. Uh, let's perhaps start by setting the scene and I'll try to be brief here. The paper uh, discusses the protection gap, uh, how it affects the economy and the society, what may be the impact of climate change on this protection gap, and possible policy options to tackle it. By protection gap, we mean the uninsured portion of the economic losses caused by a catastrophic uh, event, and for the purposes of our discussion today, we focus on climate-related natural disasters. Uh, I think it was mentioned also by the Vice President of ECB, only about a quarter of the losses caused by extreme weather and climate-related events in the EU are currently insured. And uh, in several countries, this share is below 5%. Uh, using as a source the EOPA Risk Dashboard and Protection Gap, the chart on their, the graph on the right-hand side uh, provides an overview of the average coverage per country. Uh, there are differences, uh, and there are all various reasons also why that explain this uh, protection gap. These reasons range from misconceptions regarding severity and likelihood of uh, catastrophic uh, events to disposable income, but sometimes also other structural reasons. Now, with the situation being what it is, the climate change is expected to pose additional challenges. As catastrophes become more frequent and more severe, insurance becomes more valuable from a macroeconomic but also societal perspective. Of course, with, while private insurance uh, coverage is beneficial and desirable, insurance provision should be carefully designed to ensure that it encourages adoption and, re and reduces vulnerability to climate-related uh, catastrophes over time. Now, the design of insurance policies can provide incentive to policyholders for risk reductions and adaptation while limiting moral hazard. For example, via impact underwriting, we'll say a couple of words more on that uh, as we proceed. At the same time, as insurance claims uh, increase due to climate change, perhaps, premiums are likely to increase as well and or coverage to fall, thereby further widening the protection gap. One could indeed uh, expect that the catastrophe insurance protection gap could widen in the medium to long term as a result of climate change, partly because of uh, repricing of insurance contract in response to increasingly frequent and intense events. This may lead, of course, to such insurance, to insurance becoming unaffordable. Uh, and as mentioned already, this would further increase the burden on governments, uh, both in terms of macro impact, macro risks, but of course on fiscal spending to cover the uninsured portion of uh, losses. That is, higher losses due to climate change may put pressure on the macroeconomic and financial stability. So what is this impact to the macroeconomy? What is the impact to the economy and the financial stability? Climate-related extreme events can cause significant economic disruption that may persist over time. Uh, direct uh, aggregate losses in the EU amounted to approximately 500 billion in the period between 1980 and 2020. While this implies that the average impact per annum has been quite limited, uh, approximately perhaps even less than 0.1% of GDP, this does not necessarily hold true for specific years that the losses can be more significant. In addition, uh, the relevant literature indicates that the costs of climate-related uh, macroeconomic effects of uh, natural catastrophes are expected to rise across EU countries uh, for the course of this uh, century. 
here, catastrophe insurance plays an important role in mitigating the negative macroeconomic effects of disasters in various ways. First, uh, it enables the economy to recover faster by providing uh, prompt by promptly providing the necessary funds for reconstruction and limiting the period of lower output. Second, catastrophe insurance can increase resilience by improving the understanding and assessment of climate change risks and promoting risk reduction and adaptation measures. And third, uh, it allows the mutualization of risks, which is an important factor in this uh, context, uh, and their transfer to private insurance and reinsurance companies, which can provide expertise and incentives for resilience, efficiency and reliability. Empirical evidence confirms this, confirms that the impact of disasters in GDP growth depends on insurance coverage. We can see this perhaps taking a, a quick look at the graphs of the right-hand side again. Uh, for example, here, uh, a large-scale disaster can cause uh, over 0.1% of GDP worth of direct losses. This is a clear, uh, let's say, hit at the GDP at the, due to the impact of this catastrophe event. This uh, can have an impact, a second round impact of around 0.5 percentage points in the quarters and in the following quarters, if the share of uninsured, uh, or, or if the share of insured losses is low. This happens because, in addition to direct losses, there may be disruption of economic activity, production, etc. The adverse effect of uh, on GDP growth also persists over the subsequent three quarters. However. If a high share of damages is covered by insurance, the indirect impact of GDP growth will be significantly reduced. And this brings us back to the uh, relevance of catastrophe insurance and why a widening of the insurance protection gap may pose financial stability threats. This potential impact on uh, GDP growth and financial stability and the relevance of catastrophe insurance and the impact of production gap motivated the cooperation between ECB and AOPA and was already mentioned by Irene and uh, our chairperson. It was and still is an excellent cooperation between these two EU institutions, bringing together experts of various disciplines, uh, insurance, reinsurance, econo economics, financial stability uh, and uh, climate, of course. The results of this cooperation is this uh, joint discussion paper, as we frame it, outlining policy options to address climate insurance protection gap in Europe. It highlights the need to complement ambitious uh, mitigation policies to tackle climate change with more efficient financial protection against climate-related catastrophes. Now, this effort should be complementary to any existing mitigation policies uh, to tackle climate change, and it should not be seen in isolation or, uh, of course, as a substitute to such uh, policies. The discussion paper, and you will hear us saying it a couple of times uh, today, does not present firm conclusions on uh, specific policies that need to be implemented as they are. Uh, the, the, the case here, the idea is that there are a number of uh, stakeholders be, that they are relevant on such topics that go beyond supervisory authorities or central banks. So the aim here is to spark a discussion and receive feedback on, poli on possible policy options to tackle the protection gap. perhaps changing slides. Yeah. So in order to do so, we start by setting out some basic uh, principles or objectives that in our view uh, ought to underlie any policy options to reduce the climate insurance protection gap. Uh, this could include and at least aim at uh, providing prompt insurance uh, claim payouts after a natural disaster. This was mentioned already, the relevance of having prompt uh, capital, uh, let's say, injected back into the economy. It should also incentivize risk mitigation and adaptation measures. You may be familiar with the term uh, impact underwriting. This is an underwriting and a pricing strategy aimed at incentivizing the policyholder to implement ex ante structural measures that reduce exposure to climate-related hazards. For instance, uh, you could have pr premium discounts that provide incentives to implement adaptation and mitigation measures that minimize physical risk exposure to climate-related events. But not only at the individual level, as you will see later, also when uh, Sujit presents the latter approach, these preconditions, uh, there, there may be some preconditions that can also incentivize adaptation measures at the country level. Now, policy options are also des uh, designed to uh, be complementary to existing insurance coverage. Uh, mechanisms require, as we say, that all relevant stakeholders have uh, skin in the game and policy options should ensure that the costs and responsibilities associated with uh, having a resilient 
catastrophe insurance coverage program are shared between the public and the private sectors, keeping, as we said, skin in the game retained retain also on the latter. Furthermore, policyholders should also retain part of the risk uh, in order to mitigate uh, potential moral hazard or could, alternatively, be offered reduced premiums, as mentioned already, in return for implementing risk mitigating measures. Uh, finally, and this is also very important, uh, I put another aim of such, uh, let's say, policy options should be to uh, lower the share of economic losses from major natural disasters borne by the public sector, at least over the long term. Uh, the purpose of, uh, any, uh, of our discussion today and any other policy options uh, described in the paper is not to provide an unconditional taxpayer-funded financial guarantees for uninsured losses uh, to, but rather to enhance efficiency in the way public funds are used and reduce moral hazard relative to the typical status quo of unconditional and sometimes poorly targeted government support as it stands uh, today. Over time, this should help ensure that private insurance markets contribute to and function in an orderly manner that in the face of climate change uh, induced risks and reduce the need for government financial uh, intervention. Uh, I think now I will pass the floor to uh, our, my colleague from the ACEB, who will go a bit more into the details of uh, the policy options, and uh, we will be happy at the end, as I mentioned already by Grant, to take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, Dimitris. And as, as you said, um, I will uh, set out, um, uh, turning to the next slide, um, some of the policy options that are set out in the discussion paper in a little bit more detail. Uh, so we summarise those in a ladder approach, which you can see on this slide, and that's designed to address the losses borne by various parties at different uh, loss layers. Uh, there are four rungs to that. The first two layers uh, focus in particular on enhancing private insurance reinsurance markets, which should remain the first and primary line of defence. And that includes both uh, traditional insurance and reinsurance, but also greater use of alternative risk transfer, in particular instruments such as catastrophe bonds. Then we consider the role that national public authorities can play, including by providing uh, public backstops through, for example, public-private partnerships. And finally, we show how risks could be pooled at a European level. So let's go through those steps uh, one by one. Turning to the next slide, uh, we focus on, uh, firstly, on, as I said, on private insurance. And there are several aspects uh, to improving uh, the design of private insurance uh, products. As Dimitris has already said, impact underwriting uh, could play a very important role here. Uh, and we think that it may be valuable that insurers design their policies to encourage households and firms to better adapt to climate change, to reduce their exposure, and also to increase their resilience. There are different possibilities here. For example, risk price premiums are likely to be, are likely to be important in setting the right incentives for policyholders. And as Demetrius mentioned, there could also be premium discounts uh, in relation to taking adaptation measures. So, for example, if you flood proof your home and you're in a flood prone, flood prone area, then you can get a discount on your insurance premium. Beyond that, we also think that there could be a role for greater consistency and in information in relation to private insurance. And that can play an important supporting role in, in fostering the deepening of private insurance markets. So that could include enhanced coordination between the public and private sectors in relation to risk assessment practices uh, and standards. Uh, but in addition, there could also be uh, value in information campaigns targeted at policyholders, which are ideally you know, focusing on the granular information about the risk exposure of the policyholder uh, at local level and potential uh, adaptation measures uh, and the potential effectiveness that policymakers could take. And we think that sort of informational uh, uh, and, and awareness uh, raising could be useful in, uh, in helping to combat behavioural traits and information constraints that may uh, hinder the take up of private insurance that are beyond affordability and access. The next rung uh, involves reinsurance and a greater use of capital market instruments such as catastrophe bonds. Now, catastrophe bonds can help insurers to pass on part of the risk to a broad set of investors in capital markets. And they allow uh, the issuer to receive funding for reconstruction from investors if a disaster occurs within the maturity of the bond. And if that doesn't happen, the issuer pays a regular coupon to investors. And the benefits of these in instruments, which we set out on the slide, are that they can provide uh, high diversification for insurers uh, because part of the tail risk is uh, passed on to capital markets. 
In addition, uh, they can tap a broader set of capital market investors and provide higher capacity. And together, these, uh, these dimensions may help to lower, um, lower premiums overall. In addition, they're typically structured as multi-year contracts with locked-in rates, which can also help to reduce the risk of abrupt exit and can help to lower price volatility. So they have several potential advantages. They may also be um, susceptible to investor success sentiment. So they, you know, there is a complementary role. Reinsurance continues to have strong value, but catastrophe bonds may be particularly useful al alongside. So we think that deepening catastrophe bonds markets could be uh, very valuable in supporting the overall supply of in insurance. There are several possible options that we set out in the discussion paper, which could be valuable in that regard. For example, reducing issuance costs, simplifying the issuance process, potentially issuance by the public sector. There are obviously public sector issuers, for example, the World Bank that have been very active in these sorts of markets. Uh, uh, but we think that, you know, deeper public sector issuance could be valuable. It could also be an investment option in terms of governments or EU schemes that I'll come on to. And more broadly, uh, we think that there may be a role that uh, deepening a capital markets union more generally in the EU, which could help to promote the depth and liquidity uh, of, of markets in a, in a more general sense and has a lot of other benefits, could also be valuable in helping to deepen catastrophe bond markets as well. Let me now turn to the, to the public sector. Uh, and I think here it's important to start by noting that fiscal spending after disasters is likely to remain an important part of catastrophe relief, even with better incentives for private insurance, even with deeper catastrophe bond markets. Uh, the public sector is likely to remain on the hook for uh, some losses, notably for public infrastructure, but also just, just from uninsured portions that may, be, may have significant welfare and macroeconomic consequences. And this suggests that it's important that the public sector is better prepared uh, to deal with these uh, rising catastrophe risks. Now, as Dimitri said, it's important that, uh, to, to make clear that the objective here is not to, not to provide blanket guarantees, um, uh, but rather to lower the short share of losses borne by the public sector, reduce moral hazard. And that's relative to a status quo where we often have unconditional government support after disasters. Uh, so that, that's a really important upfront objective. So in this regard, we think that moving towards ex ante strategies is going to be very important so disaster risk management strategies which are set through and set out ex ante will make it easier to manage fiscal costs and the associated risks from catastrophes that can include precautionary measures such as um, spending on climate adaptation things like seawalls or or irrigation but also measures on the vulnerability of buildings planning rules that uh, determine the location of exposures Climate change resilient public investments are also likely to be important. So that's in terms of the adaptation side of the story. In addition, uh, fiscal preparedness in a general sense it would be very useful. That one aspect would be to include climate related catastrophes into double, international debt sustainability assessments, but also the role of building fiscal buffers at a national level to provide contingencies that help to mitigate sovereign risks upon disasters striking. The discussion paper also spends quite a bit of time talking about public-private uh, partnerships, uh, which can play an important uh, role in improving risk assessment, preventing, sorry, can we stay on the current slide, um, which can uh, improve uh, um, risk assessment, risk prevention, and, and facilitate risk transfer while also providing a public uh, backstop to private reinsurance. As was noted by the Vice President, they already exist in some European countries, and they can partly cover the cost of insurers that insurers may occur in the event of major disasters, either via direct insurance or via, via acting as a reinsurer as, of last resort. And they can build in effective incentives for risk mitigation and adaptation. So we set out some key principles that public-private partnerships should ideally have, on, uh, as you can see on the slide, for them to be efficient and effective. And that includes risk sharing, um, so that the costs and responsibility are borne across public and private sectors. Uh, the importance of setting the right incentives for uh, prevention and adaptation measures so that uh, a moral hazard is also mitigated and that adaptation measures are implemented. And partial insurance so that only a portion of the economic cost is insured, again, to help mitigate uh, moral hazard. Finally, uh, the, the last rung on the ladder we discuss is a possible EU-wide public sector scheme uh, to cover larger, rarer but larger climate-related catastrophes. And we think that such a scheme could complement and reinforce nat national measures and help to more efficiently pool catastrophe risks, which typically are 
hitting different EU countries at different times and, you know, have a, a, a mild correlation. So we see that a lot of major EU countries, all the EU countries are facing climate related catastrophes, but they, you know, different countries are exposed to different hazards and different vulnerabilities. So we think that such a scheme could uh, foster risk pooling at the EU level, but also complement the EU's wider climate uh, policies and existing tools for disaster relief, such as the EU Solidarity Fund, uh, which may be constrained by a lack of financing power uh, currently. And they, such a scheme could, in principle, ensure new risks, provide different support or, or on different, uh, different terms. On the right, we set out some of the key principles that a public insurance scheme might adhere to, uh, which are discussed in more detail in the paper itself. I'll just select, highlight a few. We think it uh, would be likely to be important that it should cover all uh, EU-wide, um, or, or part, be subscribed to by the, the whole of the EU, and covering all large-scale climate disasters and have sufficient um, financing power, as I've already mentioned, with part of the support also being uh, provided as grants, so some degree of mutualization. At the same time, in any such scheme, it's also going to be important to have safeguards to ensure member states improve their own resilience to catastrophes rather than solely relying on relief from the EU. And that could be done, for example, by partly linking contributions to actual risk exposure, uh, so the partly risk-based contribution principle, and also granting access only uh, once member states have implemented and agreed uh, adaptation strategies and perhaps met their emissions reduction targets. So that's the idea to incentivize adaptation, also incentivize measures to be taken at the national level. So to sum up uh, and to turn to the last slide, um, the policy ideas we've set out in the paper are aiming to reduce the climate insurance protection gap at four levels around private insurance. Firstly, enhancing a reinsurance in catastrophe bond markets, developing public-private partnerships and, and the role that the national uh, authorities can play, and finally, a potential EU-wide uh, fund for national, national disaster insurance. It's important to say that these are very much policy options. Uh, the purpose of setting out this discussion paper was really to elicit feedback on these ideas, and we are inviting comments and feedback on all aspects of the discussion paper, ideally by the 15th of June, but we're also very interested to hear your questions and comments during the workshop today. And subsequent to that, we will be undertaking further analysis of the options, taking into account the comments that have been uh, that we receive today in written form uh, and through other uh, fora and engagement that we will be having in the coming weeks. With that, I will say thanks very much and I will pass it back to Irina. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, to both Sushit and Dimitris for setting out the content of the paper so clearly and setting out the ladder on what are the policy op options and how to increase the the involvement over time of the different actors in, in the whole space and also which responsibilities everybody should have in this regard. I see that we still have some time for some questions, so that's a good uh, good sign and I hope we have questions from the room, but let me kick off with one because maybe not everyone here today joining online or in the room is so familiar with the mandates of IOPA and the ECB. We've been talking about that you took it for granted, so maybe uh, Dimitris, can I invite you first uh, to set out a bit? What is the role of IOPA in this regard? Why? Yes. What are you doing, and how do you complement also the work of the ECB? Where you? Where, where is it different? Where do you work together? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> indeed, when when you deal with the uh, with insurance protection gap, is what we call the protection gap paradox. Why? Because. Uh, AOPA being uh, an insurance supervisory authority, one would say that supervisors should care more about the risks taken than the risks not taken. So you would say that as a direct supervisory authority, you should not really worry if there is, let's say, a part of the market that is that the insurance sector is not exposed to risks. Nonetheless, yes, this may hold true in the short term, so perhaps within a year, and the fact that most uh, non-life uh, products are annually repriced or the contracts expire within a year, uh, this you may say, well, from a short term uh, view on the financial stability of the sector, this is true. Nonetheless, uh, going a bit to the medium or long term, the financial stability overall is affected, which in turn will impact the sector uh, back. So if you're talking about uh, events that occur that will impact the economy, they impact the financial stability of the whole financial system, it will in consequence uh, also affect the profitability of, your, of insurance, pensions, but uh, as said already of the overall economy. And this 
let's say the uh, the impact on financial stability is the common point between our mandate and our point of interest with our ECB colleagues and of course very relevant to the discussion on the protection gap. Thanks so much Dimitris uh, Sujit. Uh, do you have any, no, no. anything to add on this? Thanks point? very much. I mean, so, I mean you know, starting obviously with the financial stability mandate, I know that's quite central to our thinking here as Dimitris has already uh, mentioned and that also affects uh, the banking sector. Uh, so for example, uh, risks associated with a lack of insurance may may trigger higher capital needs on the banking sector and reduce credit supply because the collateral uh, um, is less valuable. Um, the, the collateral that banks are taking in response to loans. In addition, there can be supply chain disruptions through operating through firms, which increase credit risk uh, throughout the financial uh, system. So the lack of insurance can have financial stability uh, consequences. And actually, one of the things we also briefly touched on in the discussion paper, sort of a related policy area, is that there may be a potential role for targeting uh, prudential or macro prudential regulations in relation to enhancing the actual resilience of the banking sector to the implications of the persistent uh, insurance uh, protection gap. And we've been also discussing those with our colleagues uh, working on the supervisory side of the ECB. So there's a clear financial stability aspect. There is also a macroeconomic uh, dimension. As Demetrius uh, mentioned, uh, we see that natural disasters have a more significant macroeconomic impact uh, when insurance coverage is low. Uh, that has implications for GDP, can have implications you know, that, that may speak to, to wider uh, wider uh, issues of, uh, around the stability of growth and the stability of, of, of inflation or price stability. Uh, and also the fiscal consequences uh, that may affect sovereigns can also put pressure on, on debt sustainability. Uh, that obviously can have financial stability implications, but it also may, may, may mean that there are asymmetric effects from shocks across the EU. Now, we saw that in a very extreme Form with the onset of the pandemic, but we also think that climate-related catastrophes, you know, can have significant macroeconomic uh, and uh, consequences, and also implications for for the fiscal uh, um, for the fiscal dimension. So there's the financial stability dimension, but also the macroeconomic dimension. Thanks so much. And if if I see that, like you both brought in different perspectives, but could you have done it by yourself, or what what was really the benefit of uh, of this joint? Like which. How, how did you complement each other? Can you give a concrete example, maybe, on data or on anything else? If I may yes. start, uh, in addition to what I said, bringing different disciplines in mm -hmm. one uh, table, it's saying discussing, and Sujit knows we have been discussing for quite some time with a good number of uh, colleagues. I think it is the fact that, you, first of all, you, you said the same. You, you acknowledge the fact with the hard data that when the protection gap is quite large, the impact on the macro side is quite uh, more uh, significant. Then you need to apply uh, to, to explore different solutions, different ways of dealing with it. Then the insurance mindset, insurance and reinsurance mindset, try to have some kind of, uh, I think it was mentioned before, reinsurance of last resort. Is there, a, uh, let's say, a role for the public sector to take on board this role? And having, let's say, a mindset that has a, an insurance, a risk-based uh, approach to not cut events is where the insurance, let's say, expertise may kick in and complement the more, let's say, financial stability and macro look. In addition to what was mentioned already, that we must not also neglect the impact on uh, the banking sector and second round effects stemming from that. Yeah, no, I very much subscribe to that. I mean, I think um, AOPA clearly bring deep expertise and information and data in relation to insurance markets and reinsurance markets, catastrophe bond markets. I think from our side, we bring expertise in relation to, to macroeconomic dimensions. Financial stability is a hell of a common dimension, but also within the ECB, colleagues working in our financial stability area have clearly been working on this, but also colleagues in our economics department and our international department reflecting its, you know, very diverse expertise also within the ECB. And I think that's that brings complementary perspectives. I also think it's just you know, this is a common goal, and I think it was mentioned in the opening remarks that by working together, we, we can think about better ideas, better solutions, but also working towards that common goal, brainstorming those ideas and feeding off each other, I think leads to better, better thinking and better, better discussions. I think it's been extremely valuable to work together from that perspective. Thanks so much. And it, it sounds even like fun. So that's better. Uh, I see that we have one uh, question from the chat. Uh, Margie, can I give you the floor? Yes, thanks a lot, Irene. So we have a question from Diana Radu from the European Commission, who says, with an average of 25% insured losses, there seems to be an issue of insurance demand other than insurance supply. What can public authorities and the insurance sector do to address this insurance demand issue while avoiding to make insurance compulsory? 
Thank you, Diana. Sushit, Dimitris. Uh, let me try at least to uh, bring the AOPA perspective into this one. That's a very relative question because it touches upon the issue of the demand side when it comes to insurance. So what drives demand, which is something that uh, from a supervisory authority you, you cannot only assume. So what we have done and is currently ongoing at the AOPA side, we, have, uh, we are currently running a survey trying to better understand the demand side. Uh, I think I'm, uh, we mentioned already that during the presentation that there are some structural reasons, sometimes is uh, misconceptions regarding risk. Sometimes it's also disposable uh, income. Uh, but the point is to try to better understand it. So we have done this uh, survey and we will publish uh, some uh, the outcomes of uh, this survey now in June. And I think we will all get one uh, step closer to understanding the demand side. And again, 25% is the average. In there are areas in Europe that's much lower than that. So there is a lot of uh, work to do trying to understand what drives demand. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, Shushit, I think, I think Dimitris has summarised well. I mean, as I said, also there is a question, as I mentioned in my presentation, a question about you know raising information, raising awareness, um, and those sorts of campaigns can I think can play a complementary role as well. Thank you so much, Marty. You have another question? Yes, we do. From yes. Kuba Gogolevsky. Uh, so uh, he's asking, how would you be able to ensure that when addressing the climate gap, only entities which are aligned with the EU climate mitigation goals are able to benefit from this public guarantee? And will the public support be conditioned on some reconstruction enabled by the insurance payout, ensuring climate mitigation as well? Thank you, Kuba. Excellent question. So what kind of conditionalities can you tie to... Uh... To funding, uh, so Sushi, yeah, I mean, I, for the I mean, again, you know, these are all policy ideas at that stage. But as I said, when discussing the EU-wide scheme, one possible thing that we mentioned in the discussion paper is that the access to that scheme will be conditional on on countries meeting their emission reduction uh, targets. Now, that's at the national level. I think the question was a little bit at the firm uh, firm level. I think one one could, as well as in principle, I don't think we we spend a lot of time. Discussing that, but I think it's a good good thought. Is that when when designing um, public private schemes, which are ultimately uh, and allowing firms or companies to access those schemes, or indeed even households, that potentially um, the ease of access or the premium discounts may also be related related to sustainability in relation to um, the transition to a low carbon economy. So I think that is I think certainly a, a topic that I think warrants um, warrants consideration. I think it's a useful useful thought and. Um, I think we could also, one could also think about this at the level of the firm or the household uh, be, uh, beyond just being at the national level that I, that I discussed in in the presentation. Yeah, so not only conditionality tied to the like preventing physical impact, but also transition impact on uh, limiting the footprint. So, Dimitris, you have anything, uh, any views on this? Just uh, what uh, I think it is a very relevant question is at the core of the ladder approach that was presented, which starts and ends with adaptation uh, and mitigation strategies at the individual level, so at the policyholder level, uh, when perhaps to go to some kind of national uh, country support, you do need to have uh, the policyholder having skin in the game. And then, as uh, Sujit just mentioned, uh, going to the next step, going to the any kind of EU support, it needs to be in, into some type of conditions, whether the country has uh, implemented uh, relevant uh, policies uh, on the greening of the economy, but also if they have proceeded in some kind of infrastructure measures to also to, let's say, mitigate the impact of any kind of natural catastrophe event. So at the core of this ladder approach is uh, some conditionality on uh, mitigating measures and adaptation measures. And I, sorry, I should have said that it was a question about reconstruction activities. And I think, you know, when when one is thinking about reconstruction activities, I think, you know, to the extent that one can embed in those reconstructions. So, for example, you re, a household housing area has been destroyed by, by a flood, that you build back energy efficient homes in that area would, would seems to be a very sensible thing, thing to do. That's just a small example. But I think the point about... Uh, ensuring that reconstruction is consistent with the net zero strategy, I think, would be uh, would be a sensible thing to to also consider in this regard. Couldn't agree more, uh, Sushit. Uh, I think we're we're right on time uh, now to close the first part of this workshop today.